This video is going to provide a very brief overview about polymer structure and especially how it relates to mechanical properties. This is not a detailed look into the structure of polymers that can be found elsewhere, but just a very high level summary about their structure and how this connects to their properties. Polymers are long chain molecules wherein the atoms within the chain are bonded together with covalent bonds. As we know, covalent bonds are both very directional and very strong. And these play important roles in determining the properties of polymers. In between the chains, though, are different kinds of secondary bonds. These secondary bonds are much weaker than the covalent bonds, and these allow the chains under the right circumstances to sort of move with respect to each other while the covalent bonds in the chains hold those atoms together. When we're talking about these chains, they are made up of mer units. That's where the name polymer comes from. And we typically have on the order of 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5 mers per chain. And the number of um, mers in the chain or the chain length helps also to determine the mechanical properties. Ultimately, the feature of the polymer that sort of most strongly determines the mechanical properties are how mobile the chains are. And the chain mobility depends on essentially the chemical structure of the polymer. So for example, are there single bonds or double bonds? And what are the side groups that are on the polymer? So since we know that the mobility determines the mechanical properties, and that that depends on essentially the bonding between the chains, let's take a look at different classes of polymers which are classified depending on how the chains are linked together. So polymers are classified based on the amount of chain linking that occurs between the chains. These cross links between the chains are covalent bonds which hold the chains together and decrease their mobility. So the first class of polymers are what we will call thermoplastics, and we will focus the most on these. And in thermoplastic, the molecular chains are not cross-linked. So in the picture here, you see that although the chains are sort of tangled together, they are just sort of looped around one another, but that the chains are not connecting to one another. The second class of polymers is called elastomers, and so in these elastomers, there are some cross-links between the chains. So we still see essentially these sort of knots, but we also now have these cross-links. So here's an example of one of these cross-links. Here's another cross-link in this image. And so these cross-links actually provide essentially a strong connection from one chain to another, and at that those points don't let the chains slide past one another very easily. And then the third kind of polymer is called a duromer. These are also sometimes called thermosets or even resins. And in this case, there are many different cross links between the chains. So I've marked on here several of the cross links that show up. And so just by sort of imagining how polymers might move, in this case, the chains are going to be much more free to sort of move with respect to each other, whereas in this case, the chains are really going to have very limited mobility with regard to one another. Because of the crosslinks that exist in elastomers and duromers, the structure of these polymers is always amorphous. So it's not possible for the chains here to line up in any way that would resemble crystalline or regular ordering. And so those polymers are always amorphous. 
In the case of thermoplastics, they can be semicrystalline. They also can be amorphous, but in the case when they're semicrystalline, there will still be amorphous regions sort of at the end of the crystalline regions because the chains still are having to sort of fold over and stay connected to one another. Um, but there are, it can be semi-crystalline and the properties of the semi-crystalline versus amorphous thermoplastics will be different. So let's go on and look at a couple of physical properties of polymers, including the glass transition temperature and the melting temperature. So the glass transition temperature is an important property for polymers, but it only applies to amorphous polymers. And to understand what the glass transition temperature is, we're going to look at a plot of the specific volume versus temperature. The specific volume is essentially the inverse of the density, so it's the volume taken up by a unit mass. Now, if we uh, heat up our, our polymer, really if we heat up any material, but if we heat up our polymer, beginning at, at low temperatures, we will see a gradual increase in the specific volume with temperature, and that's due to thermal expansion. At some particular temperature, though, we will start to note a change in the slope of the specific volume as a function of temperature. This is a little bit dramatic here as I've drawn it, but you get the, get the idea. And so the reason for this increase in the volume is that we're adding additional free volume into the system. And the temperature at which this transition occurs is called the glass transition temperature. And it's denoted as T sub G. So that's the glass transition temperature. A number of important things happen at that glass transition temperature. The first is that the distance between the chains is increased. The second is that as a result of both the higher temperature and the increased uh, free volume, the mobility of the chains is significantly higher. At this point, the rearrangement of the chains within the polymer is possible even without an external stress being applied. At this point, there are still secondary bonds between the molecules. It's just that those secondary bonds are sort of continually breaking and reforming. So this is analogous to the melting of a solid, where there still exist bonds between the atoms, there's just a lot more mobility. It's important that we remember, though, that there's still quite high viscosity above the glass transition temperature, and that's because the long chain molecules are still entangled with one another, even though they do have the ability to move. So when thinking about polymer mechanical properties, it's important that we keep in mind this glass transition temperature because that will represent uh, an upper limit and sort of a reference point for which we will um, consider sort of, you know, are the mechanical properties going to be okay at this temperature as compared to the glass transition temperature. And again, the idea of the glass transition temperature applies only for amorphous polymers. So let's move on now and consider the melting temperature, which applies only to the crystalline parts of a polymer. So only semi-crystalline thermoplastics would have a melting temperature because they're the only ones that can be crystalline. And the reason why this is somewhat different as compared to the glass transition temperature is that in the crystalline regions, we have both more bonds and shorter bond lengths. So just like in other crystalline materials, if the temperature goes above the melting temperature, then the material will melt. One difference here though is that if the temperature then comes back down below the melting temperature, then the polymer will recrystallize. So it will reform in that crystalline state. As these polymers are, can be semi-crystalline, then as the temperature is increased, 
first the glass transition temperature will be reached. And so then in any amorphous part of the structure, we'll start to see the breaking and reforming of secondary bonds. But if it's semi-crystalline, then the crystalline region will still be strongly bonded. And then we will reach the melting temperature as the temperature continues to heat up. In these semi-crystalline thermoplastics, the glass transition temperature is usually on the order of about 60% of the melting temperature. Because these properties depend on chain mobility, they ultimately depend also on the degree of polymerization or the length of the polymer molecules. So let's take a look at how those relationships look. So in this plot, this is showing the temperature and the degree of polymerization. So this is a phase diagram of sorts showing what state the polymer would be in depending on the length of the chain and the temperature of the system. So for small chain uh, systems, it is possible to be crystalline, but this is a really a very short chains. And so they're not really folding together. Up here though, when we have these long chains, they're folding back and forth and that's how they become semi-crystalline. So we see that for both the glass transition temperature and the melting temperature, that these increase uh, as the chains get longer. Down here where it's purely crystalline, there's not really a glass transition temperature because there's not any amorphous region for these that are semi-crystalline, though, it's important to note that in this temperature region between the glass transition temperature and the melting temperature, that's where these polymers become ductile. And then depending on the length of the chain, the high temperature behavior is different, although we're not particularly concerned about that for this class. One final note about the sort of thermal properties of elastomers and duromers, uh, while they do sort of have a glass transition temperature where the non-covalent bonds do weaken, because they have covalent crosslinks between the chains, the chains can't ever really move through one another. So they remain solid. Uh, essentially, they will decompose before those covalent bonds will break. So in this video, we have looked at the structure of polymers and their glass transition temperature and how that is related to their structure.